Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center, and I'd like to welcome you to another in our distance broadcast called Conservation in Action. And today, uh, we actually have a conservation success story, uh, and one of the people that was responsible for it, Pete Gober, who is the Black-Footed Ferret Recovery Coordinator, and he's come out here for some meetings and, and generously donated some stuff to our archives. So, Pete, thank you so much for coming out here. You're welcome. Glad to be here. And uh, among the things Pete has brought, we're going we're gonna to show you some in just a minute, but uh, he also brought uh, the most recent video done by one of our state partners. Uh, and this is a very recent video done by Colorado Parks and Wildlife that gives kind of an overview of the black-footed ferret program. Correct. So with your permission, why don't we start with that and then we'll uh, learn a little more about you and your work and, and go on from there. Okay. Great. On a windswept expanse of barren land, potmarked by prairie dog burrows in southern Colorado, a team of wildlife biologists and volunteers scour the area inspecting each burrow to find the right ones. The burrows they seek are for the priceless cargo that members of the team carry in small kennels. From inside the kennels, peer the shining eyes and masked faces of the most endangered mammals in North America. Black-footed ferrets. These young ferrets are on the final leg of a long journey. It began with a remarkable discovery 30 years ago. In 1979, after a long and devastating decline in their numbers due to habitat loss and disease, the last known black-footed ferret died in captivity. At that time, the only ferret species native to North America was believed to be extinct. Then, in 1981, came a remarkable discovery. A population of 129 black-footed ferrets was discovered on a private ranch in Wyoming. Unfortunately, a deadly plague was spreading through the colony and killing the ferrets. With black-footed ferrets again teetering on the brink of extinction, federal wildlife biologists decided to rescue the remaining 18 ferrets from the wild. Since then, the future of the black-footed ferret has relied upon an extensive captive breeding and reintroduction program run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Today, the hub of the far-reaching program is located at the Black-Footed Ferret Conservation Center near Wellington, Colorado. A breeding population of ferrets is housed in large, sunny rooms under tightly controlled conditions. The males and females are housed in separate cages until the time is right for breeding. The Conservation Center produces the greatest number of young ferrets for reintroduction but other breeding facilities also participate in the program. One of the earliest black-footed ferret breeding facilities is located at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo in Colorado Springs. The ferrets live in strict isolation in a special building located away from the rest of the zoo. While here, the ferrets undergo cage enrichment exercises where they are given empty paper bags to help establish their predatory skills. When mature, they're moved from the zoo to the conservation center in Wellington for the final stage of preconditioning before being released into the wild. During preconditioning, the ferrets live in special outdoor enclosures that simulate life in actual prairie dog burrows. From inside the enclosures, they can hear and see wild prairie dogs moving about on surrounding prairie. Here, they remain protected from predators while gaining experience in killing live prairie dogs. All black-footed ferrets must experience live kills before they can be released. Prairie dogs make up over 90% of a ferret's diet. 
and healthy populations play a critical role in the survival of wild ferrets. When the ferrets have completed their preconditioning at the conservation center, they're ready for release. These ferrets are about to be set free on Walker Ranch near Pueblo. They are the first endangered species to be released in Colorado in many years. Thanks to the combined efforts of Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the Colorado Cattlemen's Association, legislation was passed in 2013 allowing Colorado Parks and Wildlife to participate in the reintroduction of black-footed ferrets in Colorado if the releases take place on private lands enrolled in safe harbor agreements. Landowners enrolled in safe harbor agreements are not held responsible should something catastrophic happen to the ferrets. Monitoring the ferrets is an ongoing effort shared by Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Periodically, researchers from each agency will gather at Walker Ranch to check on the ferrets. Two-person crews use GPS tracking to guide them on prescribed routes around the release areas at night. Powerful spotlights probe the darkness, sweeping the landscape and illuminating prairie dog burrows in search of the elusive ferrets. Black-footed ferrets are nocturnal spending the majority of the day below ground in vacant prairie dog burrows. They venture out at night under the cover of darkness, going from burrow to burrow, searching for prairie dogs. The ferrets now roam free. Survival is up to them. From now on, the biologists and researchers can only monitor the ferrets and hope that the reintroduction efforts and the ferrets' natural instincts will ensure the future of North America's most endangered mammal. You certainly have a charismatic species to work with. <laughs> yes. So that was uh, just the most recent film, and, and we were talking earlier that, that uh, other states have partnered with us and made films about the black-footed ferret, and people can go online and find these. Uh, but before we start talking about what's happening today, Pete, how about if you give us just a little background about yourself and how you came to be the black-footed ferret recovery coordinator? Okay. Well, uh, I've been with the Fish and Wildlife Service 27 years now. I've worked with ferrets for 20 odd years of that. Uh, I grew up in the country much like where ferrets and prairie dogs live, uh, the short grass prairie in Texas, and familiar with a lot of the wildlife that's associated with that habitat. And ferrets intrigued me because they depend on prairie dogs. They're very dependent upon prairie dogs for most of their food and for the burrows in which they live. And if you have prairie dogs in a locale, they're kind of the building blocks of the prairie as far as prey for a lot of other species like golden eagles and fringes hawks and swift fox. And their burrows provide a lot of heterogeneity in the prairie as far as escape cover for things like cottontails or refugium for tiger salamanders or spiders. So there's a whole host of wildlife that can benefit from the conservation of prairie dogs led by the conservation of a more charismatic species like you say, the black-footed ferret. And when did you come to work on the black-footed ferret program? 1994, so it's been just about 20 years. Uh, that was at about the time we inherited the program, the Fish and Wildlife Service inherited the captive breeding program from the state of Wyoming. Wyoming mm -hmm. Game and Fish was active in that from when the last ferrets were taken from the wild in the mid-1980s until the time that other states started to get involved. And Wyoming looked to us to get involved in and help with the captive breeding costs related to various states' involvement as opposed to their own. So by 1996, the service was responsible for the captive breeding program and directing the other zoos that participate. 
about two-thirds of the ferrets in captivity of about 300 are managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service and another 100 are spread among five different zoos, uh, Toronto, the Smithsonian, and Virginia, the Louisville, Phoenix, and Colorado Springs. And the reason for that is just to spread our risks. Mm -hmm. If something catastrophic disease-wise or whatever happens at a particular facility, we still have an ace and hole with animals at other sites and never lose them all. When you have a species that got down as the the uh, video said uh, just 18 animals and right. we really didn't know what to do with them when we took them into the wild, uh, into the captivity rather, uh, you don't want to risk everything in one place. You know, spread the wealth, mm -hmm. basically. And the risk. Yes. You're the coordinator and I think people are interested in what the Black-Footed Ferret Recovery Coordinator does and, and I think you got a PowerPoint that kind of gives us an overview of the, the program from the Fish and Wildlife Service end. So why right. don't we go through that? Right, I'll run through that. I, I should emphasize that everything we talk about here today really is the collective we, yeah. because what a coordinator does is coordinate people for the most part. There are other things that you have to consider, like animals and resources and challenges, but for the most part it's people, and you spread or you, you force magnify what you can do by getting people to work together well, and that's the very definition of a coordinator. Great. So here we go to the slides. I just went to a, an old PowerPoint. I've done this so many times through the years that it's become almost rote, so please <laughs> ask me questions if I, if I, I leave something out that's quite obvious. So here's the update as of August. Uh, I might just say, first off, we thought the species was extinct in 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, we found the last colony in 1981 in northwestern Wyoming, as the video mentioned. That population succumbed to disease. We had the last of 18 animals in hand by February of 1987. The last male, who must have been in a number of battles with either prairie dogs or with his cohorts, was named Scarface by Dean Biggins, who worked with USGS for nearly 40 years now on ferrets. Scarface was disproportionately important in the captive breeding program. He was a real macho man. And it's a good thing that we got him, or we might not be sitting here today talking about ferret recovery. Um, there was a gentleman recruited into the program while Wyoming Game and Fish, by Wyoming Game and Fish, who had worked on mink farms. So he had some insight to how to work with weasels. Uh, the first breeding efforts in 1987 and 88 were tentative, one or two litters. Uh, but then they got the hang of it, and by 1991, they were ready for a release of about 40-odd animals back into Wyoming. A different part of Wyoming, Shirley Basin, but the first release went out in 91. So we've been releasing animals now for over 20 years. Uh, we've done it at 22 different sites in eight different states, Mexico and Canada. There are a few hundred ferrets in the wild. We've released thousands. We kind of think we know what we need to do, but whether we have the will for the long term to do it and keep what we have through management is a question. So to the PowerPoint, I guess. This is a pretty elusive species, partly because of the vastness of the Great Plains and how few people live there for so many years. Even the people who had those last ferrets at Matisse didn't realize they were on their ranch. Their, their ranch dog had to bring a dead one home to let them know that they had a species there. Even though they'd lived and worked on the land for a couple of generations, they didn't know they had. And uh, we should pause to mention the ranch dog's ferret is now on display at the museum here. Correct. <laughs> so correct. If, you, if you want to see the, the ferret that... that started the recovery program. He's at the NCTC Museum on display in a very prominent place, and we really want to thank you guys for sending it down here. Well, it's great to have it here. It'll be safe here because through the years it's bounced around from a number of different places. One story brought back from the hog family who ranch it was found was that at one time it ended up setting in a dumpster and behind <laughs> uh, an establishment in Matisse and it was rescued. Oh, no. So it's good to have it here. <laughs> we won't do that. We'll, we'll keep it under have. glass. <laughs> So we've put ferrets out in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. We've kind of learned the techniques. I'm going to talk a little bit about the biology of the species, the management needs, and the political conundrums raised by prairie dogs as principal prey. Because prairie dogs come in conflict with the domestic uh, livestock grazing needs of many ranchers in the West. So this is where ferrets and prairie dogs live, from Canada to Mexico and from pretty far east to beyond the Rocky Mountains. Most of the black-footed ferrets probably live where black-tailed prairie dogs occur. It's more mesic habitat. Um, 
And when you see a prairie dog town in blacktail country, you know you're looking at it because they clip the grass short in order to avoid predators. Uh, this is a country of extremes. You'll have wet years and you'll have dry years. Sometimes the prairie will look like the top of a pool table. Other times it'll be knee deep grass. Uh, in the whitetail and Gunnison's country, we found with the reintroductions we've conducted there that it takes more ferrets for more years to get them to stick because of the cycles of both disease and drought. Blacktail prairie dog reintroduction, uh, our ferret reintroduction in blacktail country is a bit more straightforward. Typically we'll put out 30 to 40 animals for one, two or three years and a population will take off and be sustainable unless you have disease problems which can knock you right back down to zero. And that's the biggest nemesis for ferret recovery is an exotic disease, sylvatic plague, which came into North America about 1900. And although it's an invasive species, it's a little bitty bacterium and it doesn't get the attention that some of the more uh, obvious in yeah. invasive species like starling or whatever. So uh, little critter's only a couple of pounds. It's prey's about the same weight. Its um, average lifespan in the wild is less than two to three years. In fact, at one study area, it was about a year. They reproduce the first year. They have fairly large litters, three to four kits. I often say that they're not a cottontail. They're not as prolific as a cottontail rabbit, but on the other hand, they're better than white-tailed deer. So you can imagine how quickly you can fill up the habitat if um, you get animals out there. Every place we've put ferrets out over the past 20 odd years, we've had ferret young the next spring, except for one site in Arizona where disease hit midwinter and we lost the population. So ferret recovery is basically an inst instant success. If you've, got, if you've got prairie dogs and add ferrets, it equals success. If you can keep them on the ground, on the landscape through disease management. So what else about black-footed ferrets? Uh, high productivity, short lifespan, they live at night, they get out at night, the prairie dogs are out during the day. One of the reasons they're able to handle prairie dogs as well as they do is they wake them up from when they're asleep. And a prairie dog's a bit groggy and a ferret can get him by the throat and use his legs to wedge against the side of the burrow. And remember this has all happened in the vast American prairie in the black of night, 10 feet underground. So uh, the ferret has the advantage over the prairie dog in that situation. I talked a little bit about this, but I guess I'd like to emphasize it again. It's not about the ferret. It's an apex species in a landscape. Uh, we might not miss it over the long term, but we would miss prairie dogs because prairie dogs provide that basic food component. They convert grass into protein for all those other species that may at some point in the future be at risk. Mm -hmm. And some of them are already at risk now from mountain plover to burrowing owls to to swift fox, to golden eagles, to frigidus hawks. So you, you don't just get a twofer if you get involved with ferret conservation, you get a multi-species uh, impact from your efforts. Uh, these are a few of the species that are involved. I guess I might have mentioned that what a incredible animal prairie dogs are, and ferrets by extension. Um, they survive in an environment where you can have 10 inches of rainfall or 30 inches of rainfall from year to year. You can have bison coming through your prairie dog town and stomping it to smithereens. Um, you can have all these dramatic things happening. Prairie dogs have been known to communally nurse neighboring females young in a given year, and yet later in the year when it turned dry, cannibalize those, their own young in order to survive. So they're not just you know, are case selected species, they're both, and they can flip a switch in a moment. And that was a great strategy for black footed ferrets until we intervened with a lot of other impacts, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But from an evolutionary standpoint, they designed themselves to occur on a habitat that could change so remarkably that a female ferret will occupy in blacktail prairie dog country 100 acres. We've, and, and defend it from other females. So we need about 1,500 to 2,000 acres of continuous prairie dog habitat in order to provide for reintroduction and in order to get the minimum subpopulation we'd like to have of about 30 adults. So if, if you have a two to one sex ratio and 20 females and 10 males, and you multiply that out by 100, that's how you get the 1,500 to 2,000 acres of habitat. 
If you think about that though, why would a female, a ferret that weighed two pounds, need 100 acres times 30 or 40 prairie dogs per acre? Well, they're designed to deal with the worst possible experience they could have, which is the 10-year drought or maybe the 500-year drought. They've made it through those evolutionary uh, narrow places and, and still managed to survive. That's kind of a remarkable species. So what happened to ferrets? I'll talk a little bit about the, the impacts that have occurred historically here in a moment uh, to reduce them, but suffice it to say, they lived in a big country. They were pretty well spread out and we did a number on that collectively with settlement. Uh, we had no wild ferrets, naturally occurring wild ferrets after 1987 other than those we reintroduced. Um, I just pause here for a minute to talk about all the species the Fish and Wildlife Service works with mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to recover a species once you've gotten to the point to where you list it. We don't have many opportunities to bring a species back. This is one that the equation is pretty simple. A plus B, ferrets plus prairie dogs equals success. There are a couple of challenges there that have to be met, but they're doable in terms of meeting those challenges. So where we get an opportunity to address the, that kind of species, we should, because some species, the habitat is gone and it's not coming back, and these species are gonna have a much difficult, more difficult time getting off the list, and we have hundreds and thousands of species listed here, we should take every opportunity to, to finish up the job. Uh, a couple of quotes here in terms of the disparity when we were working with all our partners in the 1980s. Uh, we had this remarkable opportunity. There were, it was a steep learning curve. We made some mistakes. There was a lot of finger pointing. Uh, people were upset with each other. It took 20 odd years to get everybody on the same page again. And the latter quote there says that we have turned that page. Right now we have a recovery team that's made up of all the states involved across the range of the ferret, 12 different states, uh, quite a few different tribes, and the tribes have played a disproportionate uh, role in ferret conservation because they have such large landscapes with quite a few prairie dogs. And we have uh, non-governmental organizations ranging from the conservation groups like World Wildlife Fund and Audubon and Defenders over to the other side with the Wyoming Stock Growers and the Colorado Cattlemen. So recovering that trust to work with people has been critical. Now, there's just a list of a number of the people involved. Uh, we've found federal lands in the West that we can put ferrets out on and it may seem somewhat counterintuitive, but in some respects it's been much more difficult to work on federal lands than it has been to work with private landowners. Um, but the states have been very uh, engaged, the tribes have been very engaged, uh, the zoos have been long-standing partners. Uh, they organize themselves under a species survival plan under the American Zoo Association. Uh, they've been in it for the long run. Uh, they're able to breed animals and see the fruits of their efforts in terms of releases and populations being established on the ground. So that's a super plus for them. Uh, Della Gorell, who's the chair of our SSP group, who works at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, has often comments on the fact that, well, what do you do with tigers? I mean, if you breed them. So there are selective breeding programs with zoos where they don't breed because they don't have a place to put them. With ferrets, it's breed them and we'll put them out and we'll try to get them to stick. There's plenty of habitat left in the West. Lots of prairie dogs, even though they've been diminished materially, there's still a lot of places for us to meet the recovery goal for ferrets. So this is where we put ferrets in all the states and sequentially by year. Uh, we're anticipating cranking that up to a half a dozen sites per year through the efforts of all our partners and the development of a new programmatic safe harbor agreement which the Fish and Wildlife Service has developed to, do, to remove the threat of any, or any concerns by private landowners. Basically we've told them if you would be interested in ferret recovery, please join us. If you decide you'd like to back out, we'll let you back out, no harm, no foul. And what we found by giving folks that latitude, they're all willing to come into the tent because they know they can get out if they want to. Uh, Shirley Basin is one of the bright stars of uh, ferret recovery. We had a tough time getting started there and then we had some disease problems, uh, but ferrets have come back there big time. Aubrey Valley, Arizona took a long time to prime that pump to get ferrets on the ground there. Uh, we had wonderful success at Kanata Basin in South Dakota, number four there, 
until plague hit South Dakota for the first time in 2005. Ferrets took off there exponentially, and at one time we had as many as 300 ferrets on the ground at that one site. Our recovery goal is 3,000 adults scattered across these 12 states, so we feel like the recovery goal was, is within reach within 10 years. We just have to have a way not to backslide from these disease events that hit us at these different sites from time to time. I've uh, used the analogy of ferret recovery is not going to be like wetland conservation. You're not going to save a wetland in a place forever. It'll always be there. And this, this, this dramatic landscape, it's going to be like conserving akin to blinking lights on a Christmas tree. You're going to count populations at any given point in time, and 10 years later, you may have populations at different sites persisting for different lengths of time. And that is a whole different challenge as opposed to something in time and place and perpetuity. So back to the reasons the ferret declined in the first place. We talked about conversion, farming. The eastern portion of the range was wet enough to where a lot of farming, grain farming took place, but that was only 20 or 30 percent of the habitat, and after all, it was 500 million acres. We still had lots of ferret habitat. And then we got involved in prairie dog poisoning after World War I to aid the war effort and the bureaucracy grew on its own. Um, APHIS Wildlife Services split off from the Fish and Wildlife Service in the 1970s, but we, the Fish and Wildlife Service, were the people who were doing that poisoning yeah. in the early days, and here we are trying to undo the impacts of some of that. And then the, the biggest bugaboo for all of ferret recovery is sylvatic plague. I think I mentioned it's an invasive, non-native species, probably came into the country around 1900, spread through prairie dog populations in the 30s and 40s through most of the ferrets range, and didn't even get into South Dakota until 2005 to the best of our knowledge. So it's happening here and now, the impacts of the Columbian Exchange. Uh, we're still seeing the impacts of these invasive species from the old world. So here's just an example of the sort of thing you see out west where prairie land is converted to agriculture. Uh, here's just an example of how enthusiastic we were about poisoning prairie dogs and all the better living through chemistry <coughs> toxicants that we used. And getting to plague, this is a the plague doctor in medieval Europe when this same disease impacted humans. Uh, there was the thought that since birds didn't contract it, if the physicians or caregivers dressed up like birds, then maybe they could fool the gods and they would not catch plague. I've also read that they stuffed uh, the beaks of these particular costumes with herbs in order to offset the smell of, uh, of uh, death, and as a result, the, the plague doctor costumes that you see sometimes uh, uh, emerge from that. We conducted a symposium on plague and, uh, along with USGS and brought in folks interested in plague worldwide in 2005. The National Wildlife Health Lab, USGS, used to be Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Dr. Tony Roki has been involved in developing both a vaccine for ferrets that's injectable and a, a new vaccine that's in a bait form, just like toxicants, ironically, that can be spread for prairie dogs, which may protect prairie dogs from plague and help us keep these ferret recovery sites intact. Hmm. So a little bit more about the plague because it's such an important part of uh, ferret recovery. Uh, when it rains, you have more fleas. That's problematic in terms of uh, vector exchange for plague. When it doesn't rain, you don't have a lot of prairie dog pups, which is problematic for mom trying to feed her kids. So ferrets are caught between the double squeeze. In, pa in the past, when plague didn't exist, you always had places that it rained so populations could be restored in continuous habitat. Uh, that were adjacent to each other. But now we're finding ourselves in a situation that we're going to have to intensively manage wherever we have ferrets because plague is throughout the environment and it will rear its ugly head on a regular basis. So we pretty well got squared away with captive breeding. We know how to breed ferrets. We've bred thousands of them. We've reintroduced thousands of them. We figured out how to monitor them and count them in the field. Lots of baby ferrets every year. They go outside in pens, as was shown in the video, to learn how to go in and out of burrows lickety-split so they won't get caught by a predator. And they 
also learned to get exposed to prairie dogs. They seem to be pretty much innate killers. We're not sure how important the value of exposure to prairie dogs may be. Uh, we've gotten ferrets out a lot of at a lot of places. Folks are genuinely enthused about being able to reintroduce hands-on an animal back into its native habitat that hasn't been there for 50 or 75 years. Uh, we found that we've got, to, in order to keep those populations, we've got to count them and monitor them. And the uh, we all the animals we provide for reintroduction are vaccinated for plague subdermally, but it's not passed on through antibodies to the young. And so any animals that are hand, handled receive this plague vaccine for the individual ferret. Uh, working with landowners on the land, though, I mentioned the, the programmatic safe harbor, the regulatory assurances have been really important. Uh, if you're worried about getting most of your grass into cows, it'll help you make a living. Uh, you're going to point to prairie dogs in a dry year, whether the drought's primarily important, uh, most important for the lack of grass or not. So we're going to have to find a way to make ranchers comfortable in an economic way. And NRCS has been, Natural Resource Conservation Service has been a big help in that. They have emerging programs that are helping with that. APHIS Wildlife Services has helped us keep prairie dogs out of places where they don't belong if they're a nuisance for a neighbor. And APHIS has also been very critical along with the uh, Madison Health Lab in um, working with plague management. Great sign in Rapid City, South Dakota, the South Dakota Stock Growers Association. If you can ask these people what they need and try to work with them, they can provide a lot of benefits to wildlife on the ground. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And we did involve a number of those folks from Wyoming stock growers and Colorado cattlemen in particular here at NCTC in a planning meeting for this programmatic safe harbor several years ago. And I just heard yesterday from Wyoming stock growers at a meeting downtown that uh, they appreciated the fact that they were involved from the get-go on this. So we're talking about plague considerations. I guess the bottom line there is that um, plague can be managed. Uh, ferrets can die from plague, but if they don't have any prairie dogs to eat, uh, that, that doesn't do them any good either. So they've got a double whammy there. I talked about them receiving the plague vaccination before they go out. Uh, the papers get full of uh, how people are worried about endangered species uh, uh, providing onerous regulatory impacts on their operations. They're, they're full of how bad prairie dogs can be in a drought year. but. The big problem in the West is always lack of rain and everything else springs from that. So we've got to find a way to work with all these people and we're trying to do that. We've got to find a way with NRCS's help to deal with the grazing economics and we've got to find a way to work with other partners to address those other issues. So it's a big effort to spin plates, keep going from one place to another, trying to keep them all in the air, uh, see if you can keep everybody working together well. Uh, Finally, I'd mention that we have a new recovery plan from 2013 and it sets specific guidelines. All the states in particular have asked, what is my part of this? And so based on historical percentage of the prairie dog habitat that they have, we said, if you did this part, you could hold your head up to your colleagues in the other states and say, we've done our part for ferret recovery. Um, and we've tried to categorize sites and some slip in and out of these categories based upon the challenges that occur, but we've got a number of sites that are doing pretty well. Uh, our recovery goals are 3,000 adult ferrets I mentioned, but we'd like to have 10 of those populations hold at least 100 adults, no population less than 30. This is a wordy slide, but just to let you know that uh, we do have, again, to emphasize the fact that we've got this goal in mind, It'll take 500,000 acres of prairie dogs to do this scattered across 12 states. We probably have 5 million acres of prairie dogs now, but they're scattered. I always say if we were gonna manage prairie dogs to uh, create the most consternation, we'd do it the way we do it now, where they're benignly managed and they're scattered with maximum edge effect and you have conflicts with all kinds of neighbors. We're gonna have to purposely manage in specific sites where we want prairie dogs and ferrets to be so that we can provide the ecological stability and sustainability for these populations to make it. Otherwise, there'll be these dips and wild swings to where there'll be bottlenecks they can't get through. So that's the last of the slides. That was fascinating, actually. And one gets a sense from what you described, there's a lot of back and forth with the population. At one point you said you've put thousands in the wild, but 
what do we have, 300 or so? A few hundred. So it's an ongoing challenge. And it is, and it depends on whether you count them in the spring or whether you sure. count them in the fall. And we were uh, purposely looking for adults in the spring. We've had over, when we first started with this, we were hoping for a 10% survival over winter because we figured winter would be a, a bottleneck or a tight spot for them to get through. Uh, I know we've had as high as 75% overwinter survival at some sites. Uh, Randy Matchett at UL Bend Refuge in Montana one year tracked 16 females pretty closely and he had 12 females make it until the spring. So on average we think we get about 50 percent overwinter survival but when you've got a two to one sex ratio and they can have three to four kits these populations can expand fairly rapidly. People oftentimes forget endangered species restoration is a craft and requires tools <laughs> and you very nicely brought some of the tools of your trade out here to NCTC, and I wonder if we could look at some of these and sure. you could tell us what they are. We can set it up on the table, I All suppose. Right. I think this one's going to be pretty obvious. <laughs> there we go. Red to red and black to black. If this distance broadcast ends suddenly, we've hooked it up wrong. Mm -hmm, that's right. <laughs> okay, so to manage wildlife, and to measure your success or failure, you need to count animals. And typically, these are pretty open environments, not always. The Gunnisons mm -hmm. and Whitetail country can have some shrubs in it that makes it difficult to see. But folks will go out in pickups or on four-wheelers or even walking with a backpack and take spotlights and try to pick up this emerald green eye shine that ferrets have that's so characteristic, quite different than pronghorn antelope or deer or badgers mm -hmm. or whatever. So, but you'll see all kinds of animals when you're out in the black of night. Yeah. like that. So you need to find generally where they are, what prairie dog holes they're in and out of because they're hunting across the landscape during the night going in and out of prairie dog holes. They find one hole and they decide that's too big a prairie dog. They may go to the next one where there's a litter of youngsters that's easier to take. Uh, the prairie dogs are asleep of course and so they either will get one or won't get one and that, may, that determines how active they are in any given night. If you have low prairie dog numbers you'll see higher ferret movements. To be above ground is to basically risk a chance of getting caught by a coyote yourself. So the more prairie dogs you have, the more time ferrets spend underground. But you see one on the landscape and you wonder, well, is that one we released last year that's already vaccinated for plague? Or is it a young of the year that we didn't get vaccinated? How many do we have? Uh, in the past, a lot of wildlife populations, and still do, use these little pit tags that give a, a barcode read off of them. I first ran into it classically with fish but they're using all kinds of wildlife. And we use them in ferrets and plant them under the skin, much like you see here, this scotch tape yes. pit tag uh, to, the, to the ferret here. This is a museum specimen of stuffed animal that came from the wild. Um, and in the early days, they were trying to have the ferrets in hand and they'd take a wand and move it over the animal and read the pit tag number. And then folks got the idea that, hey, we can't spend all our time out there in the cold and wait for this ferret to stick his head out, or maybe he's just hard to capture. So they bent the wand around into a, into a circle and placed it over the prairie dog burrow, and attached it to a data recorder, whereby you could let the ferret take his own measurements and yeah. come back and pick up what number it was. And from that, you can calculate what your population is and whether or not you need to do a little more work to try to catch an animal in this particular area. So if you pass that critter there, Put mark through, through there, we should get a readout on here. It may not be visible, but is just to let you know there's a digital number readout on there. That's very cool. So that, that was a clever idea someone had in the program years ago. I think Randy Matchett again at uh, UL Bend was very much involved in that because we've seen some prototypes of early efforts he had and this is the more sophisticated version that's used today. You brought up a lot of interesting points in your PowerPoint and uh, let me ask you just a, a general question. Why should the American people care about black-footed ferrets? Well, black-footed ferrets represent something quite different for a relatively new country as compared to countries in Europe or elsewhere uh -huh. in the world. I mean, they represent the wild, open west part of our heritage that's still available to us. We still have some building blocks to work with if we want to conserve wildlife for the benefit of public into the future. A lot of those options are closed for folks in Europe where the habitat's been so fully developed for human uses. Uh, Ferrets themselves represent 
kind of iconically that prairie habitat and that heterogeneity that's in the prairie habitat where all these other species occur. Uh, if you enjoy seeing wildlife, if you enjoy um, being in wild country, if ferrets are there, you can be pretty well assured that a lot of other species are there. And you've got as close to a full component of what was here historically and hopefully what will be here in the future, you'll be pretty well assured that it's there. How uh, successful have you been reaching out to people in the states where you're reintroducing the ferret to convince them it's an important program? Sometimes I think we oversell the program, uh, at least to the agricultural community, mm -hmm. because ferrets eat prairie dogs. If we stopped right there, they might be fine with it. If we remove <laughs> yeah. the, uh, I was thinking about that. <laughs> the stigma of it being an endangered species. And again, I think we've done that to a certain extent if we get our foot in the door long enough to explain about how the programmatic safe harbor will hold them harmless against any impacts and will not affect any of their land uses. There's a big difference between the public in the West, relatively few people that live on the land, and the public that live in the cities uh, outside the West. There's a real cultural disconnect there. Uh, they're both right and they're both wrong. Um, I think I can, we collectively, not just I, can work with landowners because they love wildlife too, but they have to be concerned about their bottom line. It's uh, easy to love wildlife if you don't have a stake in what it might cost. Right. Um, wildlife conservation costs money and it requires effort by people. Not a lot of money compared to a lot of things that we spend money on in the U.S., but still it requires money. The, uh, you've mentioned a couple times in the PowerPoint and it was in the film, the safe harbor agreements. Um, has that made it easier to work with private landowners? It has. We had collectively NRCS had the applications, but we worked closely with them and the state of Colorado and others. There were 50 applicants from some of the hardcore areas, any ESA, Endangered Species Act mm -hmm. counties in southeastern Colorado, any prairie dog colonies, because some of the younger folks as generations pass are learning that you can make money off the land other than tr through the entirely traditional methods. There's ways to bring in money from hunting. There's ways to bring money in from classic cattle raising. There are niche markets, specialty markets. And in a way, wildlife conservation is one of those niche markets. The general public wants to see ferrets and prairie dogs and other species maintained on the landscape. And if the land is owned by individuals, then they deserve some sort of compensation if they're willing to modify their activities to, to meet that need. Are people doing ecotourism to see black-footed ferrets, <laughs> like they are wolves in Yellowstone and so on? Not so much. Because uh, they're nocturnal. They're, they're nocturnal. I think you could have spot opportunities for that, and the involvement might be pretty in intense for a while, and then imagination, uh, how enthralled they are, might drop off from that. It's pretty dusty work. There's no assurance that you're going to see them. Uh, it's out late at night, in the middle of the night. There's the potential for that, but I really think it's it's going to be more the, the programs that are incentive-based programs, voluntary incentive-based programs for landowners without the threat of any regulatory impact that's going to bring conservation for prairie dogs and ferrets. Now, you mentioned the, the ferrets almost entirely dependent on prairie dogs as its food source. How are the prairie dogs doing? The prairie dogs are a remarkable species. I, I may have mentioned this, but I'll repeat it again. They I know I did mention that the R versus K uh, selection factor, but how they can flip on a dime and go from communal nursing to cannibalism, it's all about the surviving adults and the next year. Out mm -hmm. west, it's, and it's kind of like a sports championship when you don't quite make the grade in a given year. Next year, next year. Yeah. You're always hoping it's going to rain next year or in a different place if it didn't rain this year. So prairie dogs went from vast areas to a fraction of that, uh, the estimates are 95 plus percent of all prairie dogs were either lost to land cultivation, poisoning, or plague. And many of those colonies are fragmented small and never sustainable in one place for a very long time because plague may hit them. So right. they're vacillating all the time. But in a gross sense, there's 10 times as many prairie dogs out there as we need for ferret recovery. Mm 
but the problem is is none of those prairie dogs are necessarily being purposely managed so they they never maintain the the stability that's needed for wildlife is there a way to make them more stable <laughs> Or we the, just... Well, there is, uh, and that is to engage, in the case of private landowners, to engage them to where they don't poison them mm -hmm. because there's a value there for them. And there, and if there's a way to maintain them in terms of being able to resist this disease. Right now, the way we deal with plague management is we use an insecticide to control fleas, which are the vector for plague. It's a pretty expensive proposition and logistically difficult because you have to go around and squirt dust down each individual prairie dog burrow and that is tiring and it can be interrupted by thunderstorms and wet roads where you can't get out and you need to get out at an optimum time because when plague decides to move it can move very very quickly. Um, the sylvatic plague vaccine that the Madison Health Lab is working on that we talked about that might go into Bates uh, potentially it could be dropped from the air and you could move very quickly to address a plague outbreak or prophylactically more likely put plague vaccine out in the areas where you hope to recover ferrets. And I'll stress again, the area we need for ferret recovery is one-tenth of one percent of the potential prairie dog habitat that's in the West now. Only 10 percent of the existing prairie dogs out there. They just got to be bunched up and large enough size is to be of ecological value and they got to be sustained where temporally there aren't those wild variations. Well let's talk about that in some more depth because my guess is this habitat is not wildlife refuges or it'd be much easier for us. Where, where are these remaining large intact prairie dog tracks where we could potentially reintroduce ferrets? Tribal lands are very important mm -hmm. in the northern Great Plains and in the southwest We've had a half a dozen reservations involved in ferret recovery. When you think about that, we've had one national wildlife <laughs> refuge involved, one national grassland involved, two national parks. So the tribes, by virtue of the fact that they have large land areas, that they haven't been as aggressive with their prairie dog control, uh, have had an opportunity and had an interest in conserving this wildlife. So tribes are really important. The federal lands, although they're, they're vast, the folks that have the grazing leases on those lands constitute a large number of stakeholders and then the whole regulatory process related to the management of those lands, you have a lot of voices, any one of which politically can cause issues related to something like the reintroduction of an endangered species. So we have found that going to an individual landowner who word is his bond and who pretty much is the ruler of his own roost, no one else is going to tell him what he's going to do with his land. And if you can make it amenable to his interests, one, you're not going to take away his firstborn because of the Endangered Species Act. You've right. removed the regulatory stigma and you found a way to offset the impacts from the loss of grass to prairie dogs. Uh, it's a way to diversify your income stream. If 10 percent of your ranch, and there are large ranches in the West as you know, if you've got a 25 or 30,000 acre ranch and you had a couple thousand acres of prairie dogs and they were in rough country or up against a neighbor that didn't control his prairie dogs and you just never were able to get rid of them and you never got that particular pasture managed to meet your livestock interests, then if, if you were to dedicate that rather than swimming against the flow, swim with the flow and find a way to work with NRCS and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the State Game and Fish Agency and APHIS Wildlife Services and, and find a way to say, okay, if prairie dogs get outside these bounds, we'll find a way to contain them. Uh, we're going to manage for disease in this area. You're going to get an offset payment uh, because of the loss to your livestock and don't worry about the regulatory concerns. Then that's good for the landowner and it's good for conservation interest too. You work at the Blackfooted Fair Conservation Center, correct? And uh, it was mentioned that's the major captive breeding facility of, among many. Uh, what are some of the things you guys have learned over 30 years or so of captively breeding black-footed ferrets? They're a single, uh, they're a solitary predator, rather. They only come together at breeding, males and females. The females defend territories from each other. so. Just by the nature of logistics, you house these animals relatively close together. Mm -hmm. And we haven't learned everything there is to learn yet because 
we're only getting about 50% whelping success out of the females. And there have been concerns about decreased sperm quality. There have been concerns about uh, disturbance during uh, the gestation or whelping process. My own guess is, is you don't put solitary predators that close together and not have some behavioral impacts on suppressing uh, production of young. So we really can't have buildings as large as the prairie, mm -hmm. so we have to make some compromises. And what we're doing is enough to turn out a lot of ferrets. And so far, we've gone through this, this phase of having too many sites and not enough ferrets, and then, t and then too many ferrets and not enough sites. We're hoping, always striving to reach some kind of balance there. But we could support six new reintroduction sites annually each year for the next 10 years. And even we have experimented with translocating ferrets from wild-born ferrets from site to site to jumpstart other populations. Mm -hmm. So we think if we get the right management prescription in place and we can fund it, then there's a way to delist the species in 10 years. We've been doing nickel and dime conservation with ferrets. As much as has been accomplished, and all credit to all the partners, yeah. it's been nickel and dime up to this point. And if we want to hit the big time and start doing it in silver dollars, we've got to find a way to do more sites. Rather than the 20 sites we have now that are coming and going because of all these challenges, we need 100 sites that we can bank on that have adequate management. We're just about out of time, Pete. You've covered a lot of stuff, and, and the last thing you said was a fairly positive outlook. We, we, we actually have the capability of recovering if we have the will. Um, but do you have any last message for people that might um, just be learning about black-footed ferrets or not as knowledgeable as we wish they were? Well, this is one we can do. <laughs> so we can have a real success story. That's right. Do you think we will? I mean, what do you think 10 years down the line it's going to look like? I think we can do it, and uh, one of the reasons I think we can do it is because we've, become to, we've come to realize how much money it takes to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. It's not easy, uh, and we're working with species now like sage grouse and lesser prairie chicken, mm -hmm. and they're, the numbers they're coming up with for long-term conservation have started to make ferret recovery look reasonable, in fact, cheap compared to some of the efforts conducted there. Uh, there's a national rabies vaccination program that would, is more expensive that's being conducted now than what it would likely take to manage plague at these sites. So lots of things are happening and we're watching all around us and other folks are watching us and you live in a new environment all the time and what didn't seem possible a few years ago it seems possible now. So I think it can be done and that's the reason I think our partners have stayed engaged as much as they have. We have a recovery team that involves 30 odd partners. Mm -hmm. um, and a half a dozen subcommittees under that. I've seen the reintroduction subcommittee, the conservation subcommittee, hold meetings over a three-day period, and on Saturday afternoon, 50 people still in the room. So there's a lot of enthusiasm for this at, at all sorts of levels in the various agencies. Well, it's already a positive story, because we had a species we thought was extinct in 79, and, and now there's you know hundreds in the wild, and the possibility of, of future delisting if, if we only have the will and, and funds to do so. So thanks for sharing this. It's nice to uh, have an endangered species going in the right direction. Thanks for sharing uh, and donating some of the tools of the trade <laughs> to the archives and, and uh, the iconic uh, ferret that was recovered by the ranch dog and, and, and kind of spearheaded the recovery. And thanks for all the work you're doing. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. And we'd like to thank all of you for tuning in for another Conservation in Action. And we appreciate your time also.